Eh, muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a un día más de encuentros con la poesía. Mi nombre es Pedro Eusebio y soy el director del Instituto Cervantes de Manchester y Leeds. Eh, good afternoon and welcome uh, uh, to a new event about poetry, one of the very important parts of our cultural program. I am Pedro Eusebio, the director of Instituto Cervantes in Manchester and Leeds. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to celebrate uh, poetry once again, as I said, and it's the poetry of Jose Angel Valente, one of the greatest poets of Spain in the 20th century. And we will do so with the uh, launch of the book by Manu uh, Odwaya, an excellent book uh, entitled Memory and Utopia, the Poetry of Jose Angel Valente. First of all, I would like to thank you uh, Uh, Manus Odoaya and also Margarita, Dr. Margarita Garcia Candeira for having accepted our invitation uh, to Cervantes, Manchester and Leeds. And as I said, uh, for us it's very important because uh, in our cultural program we have a regular uh, um, events about poetry from different countries, from different periods. And today it's a privilege to, to bring one of the greatest poets of the 20th century through uh, your book and with your help. Jose Angel Valente is considered one of the uh, greatest 20th century Spanish uh, poets. He was born in Orense in northern Spain, in Galicia, in 1929. And after studying law in Santiago de Compostela in, in Galicia, he moved to Madrid in 1948 to study uh, philology. He received the Adonai Prize for his collections of poems, A Modo de Esperanza, in 1954, and he taught Spanish also in the Oxford University. He also worked at, uh, in the international organization like uh, the UNESCO, for example, which took him uh, to, to live in places like Geneva and Paris. In 1986, he returned to Spain and settled in Almería, in Andalusia, in southern Spain, where he alternated his residence with Geneva and Switzerland. In addition to his poetic and narrative work, he published literary essays, some of the greatest mystical poets, uh, also about uh, the works of San Juan de la Cruz, whom he admired very, very much. In 1988, among many other prizes, uh, Jose Angel Valente shared the Principe de Asturias Award for Literature with the uh, writer Carmen uh, Martin Gaite. Apart from the, the influence of the mystics of the 20th century poets, uh, uh, Jose Angel Valente had a very strong influence from, uh, for example, Antonio Machado, Juan Ramón Jiménez, and very much from uh, Luis Cernuda. But today, and through the, the, the launch of this book, uh, The Works of Odaya, uh, this study will show us uh, and bring the attention to the uh, cultural and historical context within which Valente developed his poetics and seeks uh, to counter uh, and the widespread view or, or uh, the reduced idea of him as a modern mystic who was not concerned about the political realities and the problems of the society. As uh, the author uh, underlines, uh, Valente read deeply on the 20th century uh, tradition of the Jewish philosophy and thought and poets like Walter Benjamin and Ed Bloch on Jesus Sholem, and uh, were writers who had also shared the ethical and the preoccupations of Valente about the totalitarian violence of the 20th century, especially with the Holocaust and his tragedies. Before I give the floor to Manu Todaya and um, our um, Dr. Margarita Garcia Candeira, I will just uh, give some details about his work and uh, curricula. Dr. So Manu Todaya uh, has completed a doctoral dissertation of the work of Jose Angel Valente of the University of Santiago de Compostela in 2016, sorry. And he has taught in several universities, among others, Trinity College in Dublin, Doran University, and after at the moment in University of Sheffield. Dr. Margarita Garcia Candeira teaches uh, literature at the University of Huelva in Andalusia, in Spain. 
She studied at the University of Santiago de Compostela and also here in England, in Cambridge, and did her PhD on the trajectory of the Spanish poet Luis Garcia Montero, who is also the Director General of Instituto Cervantes. She has a specialized in poetics of modernity and has studied the works of contemporary peninsula poets such as Jose Angel Valente, Antonio Ramoneda, and Jorge Reichman. Dr. Manus Odayan will establish a dialogue with Dr. Margarita Garcia Candeira about the book and also uh, in general about the, the, the works and thoughts of Jose Angel Valente. But uh, at the end of the discussion, we will have to, 15, 20 minutes for questions and answers. You are very welcome, as usual, to put the questions on our chat, and I will uh, um, put the questions to, to our guests. So thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. And the floor is yours, Manos. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Pedro. Uh, just like to say, it's a great honor for me to be able to present my work here at the, uh, at the Instituto Cervantes in Manchester. Uh, I know that you've been doing a lot of work in the last years to promote poetry. So I'm very uh, happy uh, and proud to be part of that. And also I'd like to say that I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to have uh, with me today Margarita Garcia Candera, who is a colleague of mine from way back in Santiago when I was studying for my, my doctorate. Uh, we studied together and I'm you know, privileged to have someone uh, as brilliant and as generous uh, as Margarita uh, speaking with me uh, today. Uh, how we're going to arrange things is Margarita, first of all, is going to read uh, a short response to the, um, to the book, uh, pointing out some aspects of it that she finds interesting. Um, then we're going to have uh, a short dialogue, and then we're going to read some poems of Valente so that, that you can see uh, the poems themselves. And we'll be reading uh, these poems in two languages, well, actually three languages, Galician, uh, Spanish uh, and English. So I'll just pass uh, the word to uh, Margarita, uh, if you'd like to, you know, uh, give your response to the book, uh, first of all. Well, first of all, I am, I have to say that I am very happy to be here. And I want to thank very sincerely both the Cervantes Institute and Pedro and, and Carlos, um, also Manus for um, having invited me to take part in this presentation, which is uh, also a, a, um, a great honor for me. Um, after the presentation that has been made by Pedro, I would like to, about Valente, I would like to stress some points which are present in Manus' book, which I think that make a difference between this book, between his work, and many other approaches to Valente. Um, Valente is, as, like many other modern poets, uh, such as Eliot, Oden, or in the Spanish poet, in, in Spanish literature, in Jaime Gil de Viedma, Luis Cernuda, Antonio Machado, he's uh, both a poet and a critic. And Valente developed a very solid and very consistent body of thought about poetry, about his own poetics, and about uh, his own view of tradition, of literary tradition, literary uh, or, or poetry. And this has produced a huge load of what uh, the critic Jonathan Mayhew called critical mimetism, which means that critics and scholars um, systematically use Valente's ideas about poetry to explain, to read, to analyze, to understand Valente's, po Valente's poems. And this results in a kind of redundant approach, uh, not very insightful, um, a kind of tautological uh, readings and, and, and criticism. And I think that Manu's work does not fall at all, at all in this kind of category. He manages to identify, to analyze, um, to, um, Mm, uh, read those spaces of what we could call discontinuity or the contradiction between the poet and the critique. And these spaces are, are the very productive ones. And in this, in this sense, I think that the Manu's work has to be placed alongside the work of other critiques, which are a uh, very um, uh, renamed, renowned, such as Jose Manuel Cuesta Abad, Jonathan Mayhew, Jordi Doce, or Julian Jimenez Heffernan, which also share this kind of uh, inquisitive uh, perspective or view. 
And secondly, um, Manus work radically questions these very images, images of Valente as a non-political poet, something that, um, that has been also mentioned by, by Pedro. Uh, or better said, as a poet whose work was detached from any political engagement or any political stance, this image of Valente as a kind of modernist poet who was close in his own ivory tower. And this uh, was a very artificial, interested image which, which uh, um, was created, but um, which was also very successful. Um, it was fostered by, we, um, by those who kind of poetic adversaries within the Spanish poetic field, namely the poets of experience, the poetas de la experiencia, and relies on a um, Mm, very simplistic uh, understanding of the links between the world and the world, and the um, language and, and reality. And this book mm, demonstrates that there is a strong political and, uh, and specifically leftist take which presides over Valente's whole career. And I think that this is a very um, insightful and very uh, strong point in, in, Valente, in Manu's work. And thirdly, in close relation to what I have just said, this book also breaks with the conventional division of Valente's trajectory in two phases. Uh, one which would place Valente within the social realism trend, the uh, fifth generation, and the other one, the late uh, Valente, which has received different names, poetry of silence, metaphysical poetry, in which Valente would write a kind of abstract, hermetic, detached, conceptual poetry. And I think that these three dimensions are the basis of, of an excellent work that also arises like many thought-provoking questions, which I would like to discuss and I would like to address with, uh, with Manus during this presentation this evening. So, first of all, I would like to ask uh, Marus, uh, how did uh, you start studying Valente's work? How did you get to know Valente? And what was, uh, what specifically attracted you to his poetry or to his work in general? Uh, I suppose it, it's, it's a long time ago now. I started studying Valente in, in around 2006 when I was a master's student in, in Santiago de Compostela. Um, and I was searching for a poet to study. I was reading poets at, at random and I came across Valente's poetry. There was something about it that interested me. And I was looking you know, for more information on Valente in, in the library in Santiago de Compostela. And I, I noticed that every time I looked in the, the catalog in the library, that the books of Valente were in a special section of the library. And after a while, I figured out that the special section of the library in which Valente's books uh, were in, in Santiago de Compostela, it was actually Valente's own library that he had uh, donated to the University of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, so I took that as a sign that uh, perhaps I should continue studying Valente because he, he had donated his books to the library and, and it seemed to, um, to be a coincidence that I should, I should follow. And as you know, when you enter the library, Valente's private library that he donated to Santiago, it's such an impressive experience. There's, I don't know how many thousand volumes there are in the library, but- 9,000 more or less. 9,000 more or less. And it's really, it feels like a challenge when you enter that library. It feels like if you could read, if you can follow the paths through this library, you will get an education from Valente with regard to the history of, of Spanish poetry, of European poetry, of philosophy, of mysticism. Uh, this incredibly erudite man, uh, it, it is a real luxury to be in his library and to follow the paths that he went down um, and to see you know, his little annotations in the books in the library, uh, which are sometimes very funny. And also his correspondence that is there in, in the library, which is very interesting, his correspondence with many of the, the great figures of his time. So that was one of the motivating factors for me um, studying it. And of course, the poetry itself is fascinating. And his intellectual range, his, his depth of knowledge, the lucid intelligence of his criticism, uh, all of these, you know, um, attracted me to, to his work, uh, and that's how, that's how I started. Mm 
So you mm, you did not have like many notices about uh, his uh, canonical position because Valente at the time of uh, 2006, uh, he was um, he already was um, a very canonical figure, a divisive figure, as, as you mentioned in your book, but a very well established uh, poet within the Spanish um, uh, canon of the of the second half of the 20th century. You know, yeah, we say. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think one of the interesting things. Um, you know, almost uh, coming to Valente as somebody from very much outside the Spanish system, yeah. uh, I didn't really have any preconceptions about him. I understood that he was a canonical poet, that he was a well-considered poet. But I think one of the advantages uh, of, of ignorance, in, in a sense, is that I didn't have the categories um, or the preconceptions with regard to Valente's work that developed in Spain in the 1980s and 1990s. Nineties, yeah. uh, so I came to his work with a very naive view, uh, which I think in some ways can be helpful because, um, as, as you mentioned, um, and you know, as I mentioned in the book, there's a tendency in Spanish literary history towards taxonomy, and uh, Belente is seen, um, you know, for those of you who don't know Spanish literary history, Belente is seen as a representative of a certain kind of metaphysical, mystical, infused poetry. Uh, in the 1980s, this poetry was called the poetry of silence. Yeah. And in the war of for literary status, this kind of poetry was opposed to another kind of poetry, which again was uh, termed the poetry of experience. And these are both very reductive terms to describe the work of you know, a huge variety of poets. Um, and I think it has um, you know, damaged in some ways the understanding of Valente's work. And luckily, in a sense, because, as I say, out of, out of ignorance, in a sense that, that I, I wasn't really aware of these categories, um, I was able to approach his work in a, in, a, in a kind of naive way that allowed me at least to escape some certain um, cliches about his work. Yeah, yeah, and this is uh, um, this is um, easily um, we can see it very very evidently in your, in your work i would like you to i would like to ask you why did you choose the title memory and utopia for your book because it's a kind of curious title uh, in the sense that uh, the relation that establishes between these two notions because memory looks at the past and utopia the future and i think that this has to be to, with the political take of the book but i would like you to comment more on that yeah, I could I could even come back here to the title of my my doctoral thesis. My doctoral thesis was uh, titled uh, "Between uh, the Garden and the Desert," or "Between the Desert and the Garden." I can't I can't remember which, but uh, in any case, I opposed these two um, symbols, these two figures that uh, are present in Belente's poetry. Uh, Belente often uh, one of his main symbols, one of his main images, is the desert. And the desert is, you know, it refers to absence, can refer to the, um, you know, the, the post-Civil War um, era that he grew up in, uh, the desolation of that period. Uh, but the desert is also the space of revelation, uh, the space where uh, the divine, you know, it's a space of exile, but it's also the space in the biblical uh, context of divine revelation. Um, and similarly, the garden in Valente's poetry refers to a certain kind of idea of linguistic plenitude, a utopian space in which uh, world and word are united. Um, and these are two key elements, I think, of this kind of organicism uh, that's in Valente's poetry, but also these images of absence and, and uh, nihilism almost. Um, and I think Memory and Utopia, the title of the book, maps onto this difference. On the one hand, Belente is a poet of absence. He's a poet of, uh, who talks about suffering, death, loss. Uh, but also he is a poet who talks about the power of the poetic word to recuperate that which has been lost. Um, and he is also, and again, I, I, in, in, the, in the book I use, ideas from Walter Benjamin, who's somebody, a, a Jewish writer that Valente would have read very closely. And Benjamin always thought that um, when we look at the past, 
we can try to recuperate from the defeated their ideals, their utopian ideals about a different kind of future. So that when we look at the past, even we can, we can imagine the ideals of the defeated um, and we can imagine and we, perhaps we can recuperate a sense of hope for you know, the possibility of social change. So this duality, I think, is very present in Valente's work. Um, once a, a, a seeing of loss, you know, an interest in the experiences of the defeated, but also the desire for social change and the possibility of a different kind of world um, that can be derived from um, paying attention to the experience of the defeated. Well, this uh, points uh, to points to uh, to attention between between the, the memory and utopia, between the past and the future, between the elegy and the um, mm -hmm. and the hope. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, this uh, relies on a specific understanding of uh, melancholia. You refer mm -hmm. to Freud's theory of melancholia, and melancholia is a kind of very uh, tricky word because sometimes it's seen as um, as uh, vehicle for uh, reactionaries, for reaction. No? It seems that uh, melancholy is, syn is uh, a synonym of a uh, reaction to uh, look uh, uh, to the past, um, which uh, kind of paralyzes the, the, which is paralyzing, which paralyzes the subject. I don't think that there is another view of melancholy, which um, relates to Agamben theories or to, even to Freud theories, uh, which uh, is uh, very present in this understanding of the tension between the past and the future. So uh, I would like you to, to um, discuss a little bit this idea and how do you relate this idea of melancholy to the poetic world, to uh, Valente's idea of, uh, of uh, poetic, Valente's idea of poetic language. Yeah, this, these are, again, these are quite complex ideas. Um, you know, when, when I start in, 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 the, in my book, I describe, you know, Freud's ideas about mourning and melancholy. Um, and melancholy for Freud is when the mourning process doesn't work. You know, when mourning is the way in which we eventually detach ourselves from the lost object, from the loved one who has passed. Mourning is the way in which we detach ourselves and move on. Melancholy is what happens when we don't move on, when we mm -hmm. don't detach ourselves from the loved one. And even more so when this the feelings that we have towards the loved one are internalized and go inside the subject and become a more general feeling of loss and absence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so melancholy is this generalized feeling of loss and absence that haunts the subject. Um, and you know, I, I talk in the in the um, book about you know, uh, there's a kind of political melancholy I think in Valente's uh, work and his thought and his poetry, um, with regards to the loss of certain kind of political ideals. Um, he's writing in the '60s. He's somebody who is a leftist, but who is um, losing faith in the Communist Party. For example, uh, he goes to Cuba and he sees the, um, the um, oppression of writers. Uh, he he, he co-signs a letter that was written by many uh, leftists, including Jean-Paul Sartre and others, complaining about the Cuban um, oppression of the writer Ernesto uh, Padilla. Mm -hmm. So he's in a moment in which he is attached to the ideas of communism, the utopian ideals, um, but on the one hand, um, the reality of the, the, the communist uh, systems in Cuba and the Soviet Union are problematic, to say the least. And on the other hand, within Europe, you know, this uh, capitalism is triumphant. So there is a kind of melancholic sense of loss of, you know, the possibility of change. Um, but I would argue that he maintains a kind of faith in the possibility of, uh, of you know, profound social change and leftist ideas, but it is a very difficult 
belief to maintain in this in this context. Um, melancholy also in terms of even the his poetry itself. Um, you know, when you talk about the details of his poetry, um, the theory of melancholy that I use in the book is about this internalization of absence. And I use, you know, very uh, quite complex theories of Giorgio Agamben uh, uh, regarding how poets talk about loss. You know, for Giorgio Agamben, the lyric tradition really is um, a melancholic tradition because it is a singing of that which is unattainable. Uh, if you look at the troubadour poetry, the, the woman in the troubadour poetry is the unattainable woman. Um, and for this, for Agamben, this is a kind of a fetish of absence. You know? um, in Valente's poetry, I describe the way in which he he's obsessed with figures of absence. Uh, so, for example, he's always describing concave spaces. So the empty heart, uh, the, the hands cupped like a bowl. Mm -hmm. you know, he's, he's fascinated by this figuration of absence. Um, and this, I think, is, has to do with this, this idea of melancholy, a certain kind of relationship to the past. Um, that, uh, and this, this obsession with absence and trying to um, bring absence into the poem is something that, that continues throughout his, his career and is related to this idea of memory um, and you know, bringing the dead into the poetry so to speak, bring the defeated into the poem. So in that sense, uh, you know, melancholy relates to this, um, to the past in this sense. I think that uh, one, one verse that would um, illustrate this kind of relation between the past and the future is the, in the, in the No Inutilmente, when he says, when he writes, haber llevado el fuego un solo instante, razón nos da de la esperanza, is that the, the exactly. remembering of the past is a hint to the future, no, it's um, exactly. a kind of um, thing that, exactly. may, that uh, allows us to, to, to have some kind of hope in the future. Yeah, so, exactly. uh, I, think, I think that relates to this idea of his political stance of remembering the moments in the past where the ideals of left ideals or the ideals of uh, utopian ideals were, um, were a possibility, were a real possibility. And mm -hmm. his idea is that perhaps given other circumstances, these ideals can become operative again once more. And also in this... Um... A political reading of Valente, um, you stress the importance of the Jewish tradition, both the, the Jewish writers such as Paul Selman, Jave, and also Jewish thinkers. Um, I think that the first of all it would be a Scholem, but not only Scholem, but Benjamin and um, um, uh, many other uh, um, uh, philosophers. Um, I think that, well, they are obviously related to the, the notions that uh, are present in the title of the book, both memory, because the Jewish experience of the Holocaust has founded a tradition of um, studies on, on memory, as well as we know, and also with the um, with the topic of the um, of the future of utopia, because Jewish religion is based on the idea of promise, and um, this promise forces us to look ahead and not to look back. So it uh, works again on this tension between the, the the present and the past. So I would like to to comment more on the. Um, the role and the function, the importance of uh, these uh, writers of, um, of Jewish tradition in the work of Valente and in the thought of Valente. Yeah, this is this is really the one of the central uh, aspects of of my book is uh, Valente's, you know, engagement with the Jewish tradition, which is uh, multifaceted. And, and which I think um, determines in many ways his ethical stance and in some ways the development of, he, of his poetry. Um, so in, on the one hand, Valente has, of course, the long tradition of the Jewish tradition within Spain. You know, so 1492 is a key date for, for Valente because you know, 1492 is the date of the expulsion of the Jews from, from, from Spain. Um, and 
Malente has a vision of, of history, a vision of Spanish history as uh, the progressive um, destruction of difference and alterity. So from Belente's point of view, um, the expulsion of the Jews uh, from Spain in 1492 is just one more episode in this long process of the destruction of difference, which would include, you know, part of this process would be the you know, imposition of national Catholicism in Spain in the Franco era. You know, this would be a continuation. So, you know, the, the, this correspondence between the experience of exile, you know, after the Spanish Civil War, and Valente often talks about the generations that come before him, the poets like Luis Cernuda, who were exiled after the Spanish Civil War. Valente would draw a parallel between this experience in the 20th century and the experience of the Jews in Spain in the, um, in the 15th century. Um, and this discourse on exile that Valente would have derived from, from or this discourse on Judaism in Spain that Valente would have derived from thinkers like Américo Castro, who was a great Spanish um, uh, historian who was important for Belente, uh, and who spoke about you know the destruction of the um, you know the tradition of, um, of of plurality, religious and cultural pl plurality in Spain, but also this kind of Spanish discourse connects up with the contemporary French discourse on Jewish exile. Uh, if you think about somebody like Jean Paul Sartre, who was writing in the nineteen sixties, Jean Paul Sartre sees the Jewish experience of exile as somehow uh, existentially more authentic uh, as compared to somebody who believes themselves to be a member of a nation state. So for, for Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophy is about freedom and it's about um, not being conditioned by social structures. You know, it's, it's be having this free choice to determine your own life and being in an exile or imagining oneself to be uh, an, a nation, you know, imagining oneself to be um, to be French or or German for 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 Sartre is is bad faith. You know, it's, it's it's mystified thinking, and to be unrelated to a national identity for 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 Sartre is is something superior. You know, to, so there's a French philosophical discourse in that develops um, that vindicates the idea of Jewish exile. It's almost it's it's kind of like an inversion of the negative stereotype of the wandering Jew in the 20th century in the post-war period. The exiled Jew is, becomes, um, becomes valued in French philosophical and cultural discourse. And this informs Belente's relationship to uh, a French Egyptian Jewish poet, Edmond Jabez, who speaks about exile, you know, as both, uh, uh, as, you know, um, as a fundamental experience of, of the Jewish, um, of, of Jews, but also as a fundamental experience almost of, of language and of existence itself. Um, and finally, there is, of course, the development of a kind of memory culture within Europe, which has to do with the Holocaust. Um, um, there's development of, you know, uh, philosophy in the post-war period uh, that centers on Jewish experience, that talks about the defense of alterity you might think of somebody like um, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who is also an important thinker for Belente. Uh, Belente in this period, in the 1960s, moves from a kind of um, epic vision of history in which he writes poems about the great fighters like John Cornford, who goes out with his machine gun and fights the fascists. By the end of the 1960s, he's talking about the victims of violence. So he, he, he writes about the... Um, um, Miguel de Molinos, who is a, um, who is a, a Jew or a, a Jesuit, uh, a mystic who is, you know, um, who, who is uh, placed under the, um, or is interrogated by the Inquisition and is a victim of this kind of um, large uh, structure. So this movement, the, 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 there are many ways in, in which Belente relates to the Jewish uh, tradition in the 20th century. But and finally, another important uh, element of the Jewish tradition that I tried to talk about in the book is Belente's idea that um, language can be corrupted and that um, language in totalitarian states 
can become corrupt and that one of the jobs of the poet is to show up this corruption and to try to invent new languages. And in this, he's, he finds uh, the poetry of Paul Celan uh, instructive in this regard, uh, because Jew German poets after, uh, after the Holocaust, after the Second World War, felt that they had arrived at, was, was a phrase at the, at the time was called zero point, that they needed to reinvent their language because their language had been corrupted by the jargon of national socialism. And Paul Celan, for, for, for the German poet, for Belente, a German Jewish poet, would be the perfect example of somebody who took on a corrupt language and changed it and wrote in a way that was very, um, very different to everyday language because the language itself had been infected with um, the corruption of, of national socialism. And Belente, I think, sees his own task as a poet as something of a, a critic of language, somebody who looks at his own language, the language of his country, and points out the ways in which it is, it is um, violent, it is prejudiced, etc. And Manny, he has one collection of poems, which is a collection, is a collage, uh, a poem, presentacion, uh, y monumento para un memorial, or y mo memorial para un monumento, which is just a collage of national catholic slogans so he seems he sees his, his 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 task as looking at language and showing the ways in which it can be um infected with uh with um bad ideas and um so on so he has a very very complex um relationship for a um, deep understanding of Jewish tradition and it's not just at the you know some critics see his relationship to someone like Paul Celan for example as kind of an opportunistic move you know Paul Celan is seen as the great poet of the 20th century the great poet of the, the holocaust and Belente you know translates his work and writes essays about him and some critics see his kind of approach to Celan as somehow trying to gain the status or you know second-hand status yeah. of Milan. Whereas I really don't think that is the case. I really think that, you know, his relationship to Jewish culture is very profound. Um, it's, it's not just an opportunistic move. It's, it's something that is, um, that has a lot of weight behind it and, and a lot of knowledge behind it. So in, in my, in my book, I try to bring together all of these, um, you know, engagements with different elements of kind of 20th century, but also, um, you know, Renaissance, um, uh, Jewish culture, and try to use that, th those engagements to try to understand the development of, of Valente's thought and, and work over the 20th century. So it's a way of contextualizing his work. Um, and it's a way, it's almost uh, placing Valente's poetry in the context of a history of ideas. Um, so, so that's really what I aim to do with that, with that, um, with that uh, kind of aspect of, of the book. And, and the book really accomplishes this, these objectives. I have always seen the relation between Valente and Paul Celan in the, um, in the sense that they both try to reply and to contest this, ver this dictum by Adorno how to write, it is impossible, we, we should not, or we cannot write poetry after Auschwitz, because there is this point also by Valente in which he says, um, he writes, y después de Auschwitz y después de Hiroshima, como no escribir. And in the sense, I think that they, they both Celan and Valente um, pose uh, um, their own replies, their own ways of writing. Celan with this idea of, um, um, damaged language and um, kind of precarious and, and valente with the idea of the the emptiness or the um, absence the void i don't i i i think that uh, um mm, this uh, the the relationship or the use uh, of Selamba uh, Valente is not an um, opportunistic uh, employment, but it has to do with the very the very worry about language, no? What as you as you mentioned, and uh, there is um, uh, 
and an issue that really struck me as being very original and very insightful in, in your book, and is your approach to the um, to this uh, erotic dimension, the presence, the presence of the body, and uh, in the work of Valente, and specifically in in the in Valente's late work, because. Um, um, it has not been very addressed by the by the critics, and also it is like um, it is um, curious that uh, this uh, that this element, the erotic element, strongly appears in these books, um, which are these books uh, the um, the ones that have been identified with abstraction, with the conceptual, with the metaphysical by some critics, and you show that there is a strong erotic um, bodily component in books like uh, Mandorla and Fragmentos de un libro futuro. So, uh, um, what is the role, the function of this element in these books for you? That, that's really interesting because, in, in a sense, uh, Valente's approach to the body is the opposite of abstract. You know? um, abstraction is the problem with regard to the body. Uh, if you think of uh, Maria Zambrano, who was a great friend, a Spanish philosopher and friend of Valente's, uh, they lived in, in Geneva at the same time. Uh, Zambrano has a great, uh, very interesting book called Poetry and Philosophy, uh, where she outlines what she sees as the difference between poetry and philosophy. And she goes back to the scene of Plato's cave. Uh, in, in Plato's cave, as you all know, uh, the philosophers are the ones who who, um, who go outside of the cave and you know see uh, look up, up to the sun and they see the idea you no know, rather than the details of they see being rather than becoming uh, whereas the non philosophers are the ones who stay in the cave watching the illusion which is you know what is in front of their eyes. Yeah. But it's really not the idea, it is just the becoming of things, uh, and that is not truth. Um, Zambrano says, the poet is the person who stays in the cave. The poet is the person who does not abstract. No, the poet is the person who does not think in concepts. Um, so in a sense, we could say the body, you know, the poet in this dichotomy between idea and you know, becoming the poet stays uh, on the side, or the the poet stays on the side of the body, not the mind. Oh, yeah. you know, the poet is the one who wants to capture becoming, who wants to not think in concepts, but to have a immediate relationship with reality. And there's something in Valente's poetry, especially I think his late poetry, in which that he's almost trying to get beyond words. He's trying to get behind words to have this immediacy. Um, and in his poetry that is addressed to the body, I think what he is trying to do in this poetry here is one collection of po poems that is just an address, some short poems that are just addressing the body, say, cuerpo, speaking to the body. There's almost an attempt that is a kind of poetic intuition to get beyond words, to see the imminence of things, the um, uh, things be before language, things outside of concepts. So, in that sense, you know, abstraction is the, the wrong word to use. Um, in terms of the erotic, um, what, what I've tried to do in, in the book, it's quite a complicated argument and it might be difficult to, to explain here, but I try to uh, explain in the book how, how the erotic in Valente coincides, in my opinion, with a certain idea of uh, community and political community. Um, the erotic in, in Valente is always about ecstasy. It's about uh, leaving oneself to be confronted with the other. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a, it's, the erotic is about a kind of self-emptying. It's not about identifying with the other. It's about meeting the difference of the other. So there is never a complete identity with the other which is surprising because in mystic poetry, you know, often it's the identity with the other. In, in Valente's in erotic poetry, often it's uh, the confronting with the other, the joyful kind of communication with the other, uh, but maintaining the otherness of the other. And I argue it's a very complicated argument, but in, in the novel or in the, in the book, I try to relate this vision of, um, of the erotic 
with the vision of community in which the otherness of the other is respected. It's a kind of vision of community that is not a nationalistic vision of community in which everyone must be the same in this kind of absolute imminence, uh, but this vision of community in which otherness is respected, I think his vision of the erotic runs parallel to this um, vision of, of community. So that's my, my, my the section on, on, on the, uh, on the erotic in, in, in the text uh, deals with, with that, but it's, it's kind of hard to explain. So, so everyone will have to just get the book and, and read it to, to understand <laughs> that for me. And it also, it also relates with the political dimension of, of the poetry, since you mentioned the, the question of the community and the, and the inoperative community by Nancy, you know, which is the exactly. theory used in the book to explain the the, the importance of the erotic in that sense. Uh, I am I would like to finish this conversation uh, asking asking you about what um, how do you think that uh, Valente's influence is felt today? Do you think that uh, he's still a divisive figure or um, he's not a controversial uh, poet anymore? And also, uh, if there is a kind of um, Valente, Valen, a poet, tradition valentiana or valentian tradition, and in this tradition or the, the young poets, how do they see Valente? Do they recognize the political dimension of Valente or do they rely on more simplistic view, views of Valente's career? Um, um, what do you think about this? Yeah, pro probably, Margarita, because you, you live in Spain, you're probably more aware than I am of these uh, than I am of these kind of currents. But in in general, I think the the main divisions, you know, in, in Spanish poetry and this um, these polemical fights between the poets of experience on the one hand and the poets of silence on the other, that. Uh, characterized the 1980s and 1990s in, in Spanish poetry. I think most people that I know, at least in Spanish poetry, seem to have, you know, at least people who, who are, you know, really intellectually engaged with Spanish poetry seem to have surpassed these divisions, even yeah. though sometimes I, I hear certain kind of, um, you know, um, this kind of discourse on occasion, but I think in general, yeah, I think experts in poetry, people who really know about poetry have, have surpassed this. And I don't really think it's relevant, to be honest. Uh, even though surprisingly, sometimes you do get some very um, uh, ingenuous um, statements of poetic intent. There's some anthologies, uh, there's an anthology called La, La Poesia del Insectidumbre, which has this prologue, which says poetry should, excite emotions and poetry should be clear and poetry, you know, and it's a very simplistic way of thinking about, about poetry, but I think it's a, an echo of those kind of simplistic debates of the 1980s and 1990s. In terms of, I do... I do sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And in terms of the, the um, contemporary poets, I, I do know some, I, I read Ada Salas recently, who's a poet who seems to me very uh, Valentian. Um, I think we, we mentioned in, in conversation Antonio Mendez Rub, uh, Rubio as elements of, of Valente. I think one, one thing that I would say is that most people, when they think of Valente, they think of a certain kind of Valente. They think yeah. of a minimalist Valente. Um, they think of a Valente uh, who has a specific kind of uh, poetry that is even the outline of the poem on the page. There's lots of gaps in it, uh, very short poems and so on. So they miss out on a Valente who is, um, uses longer forms. For example, Valente has very long poems. They miss out on Valente, but sometimes uh, Valente who writes prose poems. They miss out on the satire uh, that Valente, Valente is a great satirist. Uh, he, he's a great social critic. Um, so I think that there is, there is a certain um, a Valente that influences people is just one element, I think, of, of Valente's work. I think there's many other elements of Valente's work that haven't really uh, passed on uh, or, or aren't very present in, in contemporary poets. But then again, um, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm sure you, Margarita, are probably more aware of these, these currents than, than I am. Well, I agree with you in these two names, Ava Salas, Antonio Mendes Rubio, I think that they are very Valentian and they rely on a 
mm, uh, we would say strong view of Valente. Mm, mm, it's a strong uh, employing the, the, the notions by Harold Bloom. They are like strong readers of Valente. Uh, but then I remember some years ago when I was doing a, a research on um, poetical categories or so the, the, the labels used to approach it. And so I read a lot of uh, uh, critical articles and um, also critical, and also uh, autopoetics, like um, um, the, some John poet, John poet's um, uh, statements on poetry. And there were many, many, many sondeos en lo oscuro. Mm -hmm. So the thing that poetry is un sondeo en lo oscuro, it was really, really repeated mm -hmm. once and once again. So I think that this is a kind of very, um, it's a, it's a Valentes, it's an echo of Valentes poet, poetics, but like very like banalized, like mm -hmm. very like reduced to a cliche. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I think, think, I think to these two trends. Yeah, mm. I think I think as well. Valente allows people to speak about poetry in a certain way. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think it's not just the, the, of the poems them, themselves, but a certain way of speaking about poetry that in certain categories that were, were central to Valente, I think, um, I think um, you know, are, are a resource for people who want to talk about their own poetry. Uh, yeah. And it, it um, created a kind of cliché, no? like mm -hmm. lo oscuro, el abismo, it's kind of um, lo vacío. Well, um, so and there's something Valente who, who always wants to renovate language, you know, he wouldn't be very happy, I don't think, with the, <laughs> Um, the repetition, uh, his, his make it new uh, is, is, is one of, uh, I think, as her pounds phrase could also apply to, to Valente. Um, okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Margarita. I think, I think maybe it's, will we move on to the reading uh, of okay. the poems? Okay. Okay, so thank you very much. What we're going to do now is that we're going to read uh, some of uh, Valente's poems, and I might just discuss um, a little bit in of how these poems relate to some of the, the themes in the book and what we've been speaking about. Um, we'll read it first in uh, Spanish and then in English translation. So um, I'm just going to share the screen. I don't know if I can share, I can share screen here. Okay, so I think a good place to start is uh, the first poem from Valente's first uh, collection. And many, um, uh, many critics have noticed with this poem that it prefigures many of the elements of Valente's uh, poetry as a whole. So we have this mention of the desert, which I mentioned is the uh, key uh, image in Valente's poetry that has to do with the desolation of the post-war period, but also this essential absence that is, is essential to his poetry. Uh, we have this question of the far-off light, la luz remota, which you know, might stand for hope, but also uh, a certain kind of utopian desires. And we have this question of the ash or the body. You know, it's, and it's a vindication, this poem is a vindication of the corporal and, and the imminent. Um, so perhaps, Margarita, if you wouldn't mind reading in Spanish, and then I'll, I'll read the translation. Serán ceniza. Cruz un desierto y su secreta desolación sin nombre. El corazón tiene la sequedad de la piedra y los estallidos nocturnos de su materia o de su nada. Hay una luz remota, sin embargo, y sé que no estoy solo. Aunque después de tanto y tanto no haya ni un solo pensamiento capaz contra la muerte, no estoy solo. Toco esta mano al fin que comparte mi vida y en ella me confirmo y tiento cuanto amo. Lo levanto hacia el cielo y aunque sea ceniza, lo proclamo, ceniza. Aunque sea ceniza cuanto tengo hasta ahora, cuanto se me ha atendido a modo de esperanza. So, they will be ash. I cross a desert and its secret, nameless desolation. The heart has the dryness of stone and the nocturnal explosions of its material or of its nothingness. There is a far off light, however, and I know that I am not alone. Though after so much time, there's not a single thought that could withstand. 
done death, I am not alone. I touch this hand that shares my life, and in it I confirm myself. When I reach out with all that I love, I raise it to the sky, and although it may be nothing but ash, I proclaim it ash. Although ash may be all that I have, all that has been given me in the way of hope. I should I should mention too that there, there is a translation of uh, Valente's poetry uh, published by um, Archipelago Books. Uh, it's a selection of his poetry. Um, so it's called Landscape with Yellow Birds, if anyone's interested in that. But these, uh, these translations are my own. Okay, so the second uh, poem that I have here um, is a poem in which Valente considers um, the political function of poetry. Um, and I think uh, Margarita has all already quoted from it. It's a poem that thinks about the way in which uh, language can be reanimated, certain linguistic formulations, um, certain ideas can, from the past can be reanimated, um, perhaps through poetry, and can you know, perhaps motivate social change. So, um, Margarita, if you, if you might be um, uh, reading the, the Spanish. No inutilmente. Contemplo yo a mi vez la diferencia entre el hombre y su sueño de más vida, la solidez gremial de la injusticia, la candidez azul de las palabras. No hemos llegado lejos, pues con razón me dices que no son suficientes las palabras para hacernos más libres. Te respondo que todavía no sabemos hasta cuándo o hasta dónde puede llegar una palabra, quién la recogerá ni de qué boca con suficiente fe para darle su forma verdadera. Haber llevado el fuego un solo instante, razón nos da de la esperanza. Pues más allá de nuestro sueño, las palabras que no nos pertenecen se asocian como nubes que un día el viento precipita sobre la tierra para cambiar, no inútilmente, el mundo. So, in English, it's uh, not uselessly. I contemplate the difference between man and his dreams of another life, between the compact solidity of injustice and the blue candor of words. We haven't come far, and with reason you tell me that words are not enough to make us free. I reply that we still don't know until when or to what point a word can reach. Who who will receive it, or which thong with enough faith can give it true form? To have held the fire for one moment gives us reason for hope, for beyond our dreams, the words which do not belong to us form together like clouds that one day the wind makes fall on the earth to change, not uselessly, the world. Okay, so the previous poem was a poem about, about language. Um, it's a poem that was written in the early 1960s. Uh, this is a poem that was written um, roughly in, in the, at the start of the 1980s. It's from a collection called Mandorla. And this poem describes, I think, um, Valente's understanding of the process of poetic creation. Uh, for Valente, his idea of poetic creation had to do with this um, self, uh, self negation. You know, for for Balente, imagined uh, poetic creation as having to do with opening a space inside oneself through which language can manifest. And often he talks about um, poetry, the writing of poetry, as a, a process of listening, listening to silence and uh, waiting for the manifest manifestation of language. And again, as I mentioned in the discussion of the body, often he's, he has this idea that he wants to almost stay at this point before the writing of words. He's interested in that freedom of that moment of creation before the words are written down, where there's this absolute potential, this absolute freedom, um, even before language is written down. So often his poems describe moments, limit moments, like the dawn, um, or they use the color uh, white. He mentions the color white a lot. And also there's, there's a certain idea that he wants to bring this 
and before moment, this, this kind of moment of poetic potential into the poem. Again, in, in, in the book, I, I write about how this is also has to do with a certain relationship to the past. It's almost like he wants absence to be presence, uh, present within the poem. So this, this poem kind of describes this moment of, um, of potential, this moment of the first moment of creation, in which the poem is uh, almost like a, a seed that is about to, about to, to bloom. Uh, so Margarita, if you wouldn't mind the um, Spanish. La primera caída de la nieve en el silencio tenaz de la naturaleza en el amanecer. Me esfuerzo en descifrar un pájaro. ¿No acudirá en definitiva el día mudo en el antedía de tanta claridad? Late en mi mano un pájaro, la longitud entera de su vuelo en el primer silencio de la nieve. ¿Quién eres tú? ¿Qué despierta contigo en este despertar? The first fall of snow in the stubborn silence of nature at dawn. I struggle to decipher a bird. Will the day ever come, silent, in the before day of such clarity? A bird beats in my hand, the entire length of its flight, in the first silence of the snow. Who are you? What wakes with you in this awakening? Uh, so as, as we mentioned, um, the erotic is an important element of Valente's uh, poetry. And, you know, as, as I mentioned in our discussion, uh, at times he talks about the erotic as this kind of pure relation, this, this moment of relationality, but in which both sides of the erotic pair um, maintain, in a sense, their, their singularity. Um, and I try in the, in, the, in the book to relate this to certain political ideas and ideas about community and, and communities that respect difference. Um, but, um, but I think this is just a good example of this kind of uh, vision of the erotic as this meeting and this creating of a kind of space between uh, two people. Um, so, um, Margarita, if you want to read Borde. Borde. Tu cuerpo baja lento hacia mi deseo. Ven, no llegues. Borde donde dos movimientos engendran la veloz quietud del centro. So, border. Your body descends slowly towards my desire. Come, don't arrive. Border, where two movements engender the rapid stillness of the center. Um, and here I've, I've included a poem from uh, uh, a collection of Galician poems that Valente writes, uh, a series that he writes, they come out in, in its kind of three different editions. Uh, in e each edition, he adds more poems to the, uh, to the collection uh, that he writes in the 1980s and 1990s. Of course, as you know, Valente comes from Galicia in the northwest of Spain, and Galicia has you know, it's an autonomous region, it's a historical nation, it has a language and culture. Um, Valente would have grown up speaking Spanish, but when he went to the countryside, um, he, he learned Galician, he would have spoken Galician. So he talks about spending summers in the countryside with his cousins and, and learning Galician. And what I find interesting about this collection is that, um, you know, it is a celebration of Galician language and culture. It's a very intertextual uh, collection that references, you know, the richness of Galician literature, the medieval literature, 19th century literature, 20th century literature. But there's a certain temptation when I think when you're 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 writing in a in a uh, minority language, especially in my, a language that's connected with the countryside, to imagine this language as more authentic and to there's a, there's a temptation, I think, for Valente to, to talk about homecoming as a, a return to an authentic identity. But I think because, as, as we mentioned, he's someone who, who defends the idea of the exile. Um, I think he, he explores this tension between the desire, the nostalgic desire to return and the ethical um, defense of the exile almost 
as a as a ontological state that is ethically you know um, ethically um, valid. Uh, so this this um, this poem I think has something of that tension between leaving and staying, between exile and return. Um, so uh, Margarita, if you'd like to read the Galician. Escoita mai voltei. Estou no adro onde aquel dio grande corpo do meu avó ficou. Inda hoy o pranto. Voltei, nunca partira. Alongarme somente foi o xeito de ficar para sempre. So listen, mother, I've returned. I'm in the atrium where that day the body of my grandfather lay. I can still hear the weeping. I've re returned. I never left. Leaving was only a way of staying forever. Um, and we discussed also Belente's um, interest in Jewish tradition and his engagement with the kind of memory culture that develops in, in Europe in the 19, from the 1960s onwards, in the 1970s and 80s. Um, this is a poem from his, um, from his last collection of, of poetry, um, and it's called Sonder Action 1943. Sonder Action was, uh, was a project by the, uh, by the Nazis to try to cover up uh, their genocide of Jews in Poland. So Belente, you know, when he's talking about memory, he's, he's referring here to the imposition of forgetfulness. Uh, if we think about Spanish, um, Spanish, um, politics and Spanish culture in, in the 20th century, there was the imposition of forgetfulness with regard to the, um, the killings of the, um, of the uh, Spanish Civil War. Um, and the Nazis you know, tried to attempt uh, the same thing with regard to their own genocides. And we can see, even if we think about today's events, we can see something similar happening in the Ukraine. Um, and Valente is, as, as I argue in the book, he's He's, one of his great beliefs is that poetry can act as a form of memory. It can speak for people who have, cannot speak anymore. It has a specific role in, in witnessing um, suffering. Um, and this poem, I think, has to do with that uh, vindication of poetry as a, as a form of memory uh, for those who, who, are, um, who are, can no longer speak for themselves. So, uh, Margarita, uh, if you read the... El humo aciago de las víctimas. Todo se deshacía en el aire. La historia, como el viento dorado del otoño, arrastraba a su paso los gemidos, las hojas, las cenizas, para que el llanto no tuviera fundamento. Disolución falaz de la memoria. Parecía como si todo hubiera sido para siempre borrado. Para jamás, me digo. Para nunca. So in English, it's the dismal smoke of the victims. Everything was dispersed in the air. History, like the golden wind of autumn, dragged in its wake the groans, the leaves, the ashes, so that the lament would have no ground. Lying dissolution of memory. It seemed as if everything had been erased forever. Forever, I tell myself, for never. And finally, we, we started with the first uh, poem from uh, Valente's first collection. Um, and this is the last poem from Valente's last collection, which is uh, Fragmentos de un Libro Futuro, or Fragments of a, a Future Book. Uh, and this, this book of poetry was published posthumously. Uh, Valente uh, died from cancer in the year 2000, and he wrote these poems as he was dying. Um, and, you know, the, the question of publishing this book posthumously, I, th I think it has a lot to do with one of the kind of intuitions about poetry and about writing poetry that Valente um, really believed. Um, Valente often quoted uh, John Keats' uh, famous letter to Richard Woodhouse when he says, the poet has no identity, the poet is a chameleon. Um, this idea that there's a gap 
between uh, the poet and their poetry. But when the poetry is written on the page, the author is absent and the poem, the voice that speaks in, uh, in the poem is, is almost like a ghost. It's, it's this phantasmic presence within the poem that no longer has to do with the poet himself or herself. And, you know, the proof of this, in a sense, is uh, after the death of the poet, in which the, this poem still speaks. Um, for Valente, the poet almost becomes a poem. You know, the, the, in this moment, after that, the, all that remains of, 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 the, of the poet is the poem itself, uh, who still somehow manages to speak. Uh, Paul Celan uh, said about poetry that poetry is what survives. And I think Valente believes uh, the same thing. So this is the moment, the summit of the song, uh, where uh, Valente and his poetry become one. So um, Margarita, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, reading this final poem. Cima del canto. El ruiseñor y tú ya sois lo mismo. Summit of the song. The nightingale and you are now the same. Okay, so um, I think that that's enough. So I, I suppose we could, I think this is the last poem that we have to read. So um, we'll just open it up now to, to questions uh, from, 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 uh, from the people who are, who, are, who are listening to us. And uh, thank you, Margarita, for, for reading so, so, so well. Thank you, Manus and Margarita. It was really wonderful. And uh, as you mentioned, and we said at the beginning, there you have some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, please don't be shy. This is the moment uh, to ask Margarita or Manus about the book or about the, the works of uh, Valente. Or any comments also, you. There is somebody who wants to comment something. I have a question for you, Manus. You mentioned that um, um, Valente was, yes, and this is one of the main topics of the book, uh, politically engaged. Um, he visited uh, Cuba and he became like the solution to which, uh, how was the reality also with the poets there. Did he keep the, the same uh, um, ideas about the world or that uh, was like a turning point and then he was more distant for, from what was, so to say, the, the ideas that they had before? It was a turning point or not really? Um, I, I think it was perhaps a, a confirmation of, of certain intuitions that he might already have had. Um, and you have to remember the generation that, that Belente is, um, is, um, forms part of, uh, his contemporaries, many of them in the 1960s, these young intellectuals in the 1960s, um, Grow tired of, and really from from 1956, really, you know, with the with the invasion of of Hungary, the Soviet invasion of Hungary, many young people on the left um, grow tired of the Communist Party. So, if you think of, say, for example, Belente was in Cuba in 1967. Uh, in the next year, 1968, you have the revolution in Paris. But if you if you look at this, the Communist Party isn't important in in the Paris Revolution. Um, it's, it's really the, the, the students are not interested in the kind of party structures. They have a lot more anarchistic way of looking at things. They're interested precisely in the erotic. You know, if you think of a book that defines the 1968 revolution, it's uh, Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization. So it's all about uh, a kind of desire for freedom, breaking away from structures, um, and Belente, I think, is, is part of that. And he's, um, he is, um, in that sense, when he goes to, to Cuba, I think he would have already, like, like his contemporaries, like people like Juan Goitisolo, like Jorge Semprún, slightly older, there, there was a tendency among intellectuals uh, of, the, of Valente's contemporaries and people quite similar to him 
to reject to some degree the Communist Party. Um, and this is also reflected in, in Valencia, some very, I think, quite cruel poems about the, um, the previous generation of, um, of uh, exiles of the Civil War, for example. He has, um, he has a very tough poem about, say, Marcos Ana, who is, uh, you know, the, um, uh, who was the prisoner who spent the longest time in, in Franco's jails. He spent 20 years in jail uh, for being a mem member of the Communist Party. And when he was released, he would go around and, you know, give speeches and talk about his experiences. And Valente has a very, very tough poem where he criticizes him. He says he's speaking in this very cliched language and that really we need to move on. We need to, uh, you know, his problem is the language itself. You know, one of his problems with the Communist Party and social realism is that for him, they speak in slogans, they, they speak in cliches. And he's from a different generation who, who are more interested in this liberation. Um, so, uh, so I think um, Belenthe always remains on the left, um, but I think he, he always had, I think he remained part of his generation with this distrust a certain kind of distrust of large structures, you know, a distrust of um, of bureaucracies. And if you think of the intellectuals, Valenti was born in 1929. Uh, so was Michel Foucault, for example, who was born in 1929. Uh, so was Jacques Derrida. Uh, these are intellectuals who are interested in difference, in um, in freedom. Uh, not in the neoliberal kind of capitalist sense, but th they kind of resist, there's certain uh, an anarchistic edge to them. And I think Valente, Valente you know, um, shares that. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a question from Silvana Serra. She says, the presentation is a comment, it has been excellent in clarity and richness of content. I would like uh, just, I, I would, sorry, I would just point out how much Valente's work, work is relevant to our time. I think I think so very much. Yeah, it's not a question; it's just a comment that is uh, is uh, very relevant in our times. If Silvana would like to like to elaborate on that, I'd be I'd be really interested to to hear. Uh, I don't know if... Any more uh, questions or comments? So, if not, I would like I would like just uh, to thank you again for this wonderful presentation of the work of, uh, of, of uh, Valente through your uh, excellent book, Memory and Utopia, the poetry of Jose Angel Valente, which will be at uh, your disposal of also for those who live or are in, uh, in England and the near from the north of Manchester or Leeds, we will have the book in our library uh, very soon. So thank you very much, Manu. Thank you, Margarita. And thank you to all our audience. And uh, we wait for you for the next uh, meeting of events of literature with uh, Professor Diana. Thank you. Have a nice uh, bank holiday also. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. Bye-bye.